Hello, YouTube. This is Tony here with another reading to you. Today, we're going to read the journal. Chapter 1. I never thought one small lace in Japan could make such a big difference in my life, but she did. I'm talking about my Aunt Walker. She came to visit us. The summer, a lot of things changed in our house, including me. That summer turned special from the day Mama got the letter that caused her strange behavior. It was on a Tuesday, one of the days Mama went to work for Miss Phillips to clean her house and scrub her floors. The minute I got home from school, I walked in the kitchen and knew something was wrong. Well, not wrong exactly, but strange. I felt the way I do when I got one sweater button in the wrong hole or when I put my left slipper on the right foot. In the first place, water was dripping from the faucet and splashing as if his mama had left in the sink. Ordinarily, mama never, never leaves the house without checking the faucet to see that they're turned off good and tight. And she never leaves very dishes sitting in the sink when she goes to work. But that wasn't all. She left so many things scattered all over the dish table. I can't even see the yellow oil cloth cover. The Japanese tea table was spread out on the table with a square hole in it where Mama had cut out a recipe for the day. And she hadn't even bothered to put away the scissors and cheese. There were two or three bills Mama hadn't opened, and a five-page letter from Japan that hadn't been put back in the envelope. The table was a mess. And if I hadn't left, if I had left it that way, my little brother, Joji, he would sure have heard about it from Mama. I looked at the Japanese writing in the letter, squiggle up and down the soft rice paper, like a lot of skinny black spiders. I wish I could read it, but of course I couldn't, because I don't study very hard at Japanese language school. And besides, I'm not far enough advanced to read that kind of writing. All I could read were the numbers that said, first day of the fifth month, 1935. I had a hunch, though, that whatever was in this letter was the reason Mama had gone off acting like Josie instead of her own new self. And I couldn't hear it till late until she got home to tell me what was in the letter. I stuffed letter in an envelope and grabbed an apple from the bin from the sun porch and headed for Papa's barber shop. It was a hot day, but I ran all the way to Shutnuck Avenue. I got to wait until I had gotten to Channing Way before crossing Shutnuck. That meant I had to walk by the Star Laundry, which I usually avoid like a nest of cobra because of Mr. Wilbur J. Starr, the owner. The reason I hate and despise Wilbur J. Starr is because he's so mean and nasty. Once I was in the fourth grade and Josie and I walked by his laundry on the way home from Papa Shop, old Wilbur J. Starr was standing in the doorway of his laundry, and when Josie and I my, walked by my own business, he yelled, Get out of here, you damn jack thing. Josie dropped my hand and began to run. Come on, Rinko, he yelled. He's gonna get up. And he went on screaming at him, counting hard on his little fat legs. I wanted to run with him, but when I heard Wilbur Starr laughing behind us, I just held up my head and said, Josie, which Henry never heard of. But my knees were shaking so hard I could barely walk home. Ever since that day, I never, I never, I tried never to walk by it, so I'm just, I can help it, because I hate the way I felt when Oversar called me a gap. It made me really mad, but it also made me feel though I, I, I was no good. I felt ashamed of who I was, and wished I could shrink right down to the screen of the sidewalk. There were a few white girls in my class at school who make me feel the same way, too. They never call all me Ching Chong Chinaman or Japs the way some of the boys do, but they have other ways of being mean. They talk to each other, but they talk over and around and right through me, like I was a plane of grass, and that makes me feel like a big nothing. Some days I feel left, so left out, I hate my black hair and my Japanese face, and having a name like Winky to Tomorrow that nobody can pronounce or remember. And more than anything, I wish I could just be like everybody else. I thought it would be wonderful if my best friend Tammy and Nicola could be in my class so I could have at least one friend at school. But when our old school was closed because of Earth, there was an earthquake group, it was split up in some different schools. And I go to Madison, where most of the kids are white and live in nice houses up in the Beth Berkeley Hills. I would never have made the mistake of crossing Chuck Avenue so soon that afternoon if I hadn't been so busy thinking about the letter. But since I had just turned my head and passed, the star laundry, I wouldn't see Miss Star. He was standing in the corner. I got a whiff of the hot iron steaming a damp cloth as it went by. I thought I thought a few mean thoughts. I hope some of the presses were burning fuzzy brown holes in the face of I it would serve over Star right. 
I turned up turning away and went past Uncle Candace's dry cleaning shop. He wasn't he isn't really my uncle. He's one of Papa's best friends since they came over from Japan together on the same trip. And he comes to our house every single Sunday of the year. In fact, it wouldn't feel like Sunday if Uncle Candace didn't come. I was ready to wave and holler at him as I went by, but I guess he was in the back at it. I had a sewing machine, mending clothes, or maybe carrying a suit to make a little extra money. Mama says Uncle Canada is the best tailor in Berkeley and so is better than any woman she knows. When I go to Papa's barbershop, I push open the door with the gold lettering that says Shintoro Tusamora, first class barber, and heard the little bell ring over my head. There was no sign of Papa and his two barber chairs were empty, but I knew where to find them. He'd be out in the lot behind his shop working on somebody's car. If Papa had his way, he would be a mechanic or a repairman. He'd probably spend every minute of the day working on anything that needed fixing it and read popular mechanics in his spare time. Papa says someday, when he paid up all his debt, he's going to rid the barber shop and open a garage and repair shop. That's the only one, that's only one of his dreams to go with telling us not to be afraid to have all the big dreams we want. I guess mine has become a teacher. Even though my older brother, Cal, says no public school in California will ever hire a Japanese teacher. Well, I said no more. You're studying at the university to be an engineer, aren't you? Cal shrugged and said, that doesn't mean anyone's going to hire me. I'll probably end up selling cabbages and potatoes at some produce market, just like all the Japanese guys I know. I hate it when Cal talks like that because I'm because then I think I'll never get to be a teacher after all. Cal knows a lot more than I do. I usually believe what he tells me. When I went out to the lot in the back of the barber shop, sure enough, there was Papa working under somebody's car. I could see his two feet sticking out, and I yelled at him, Hey, Papa, you sure are some barber. Right away, Papa came sliding out, open the sweat from his sleeves, and was squinting up at me from the sun. Even in his dirty overalls, the sweet from my gunner's face, I thought Papa was good looking. He and his he and my brother, Cal, have large, dark eyes, naturally wavy hair that I cover with all my heart. I guess Cal got all the good things because he was born first. By the time I came along, there were only straight hair, small eyes, and skinny legs to go around. Problem was surprised to see me. What are you doing here, Rinko? He asked. You have a haircut already? I should hope not, I said. Papa only has to trim my hair about once a month now that I let it grow long. I can hardly wait until I'm old enough to go to beauty parties for real haircut. Mom says I have to wait until I'm 16, so I still have five more years to go. Tom was really ready to slide back into the car again, so I waved the letter at him and told him about the mess Mama had left in the kitchen. That caught his attention, because he knows Mama would never waste even one drop of water leaving the faucet there. He is so careful. He saves everything from straps of, scraps of cloth to pieces of string. He even has a ball of silk thread made of all the tiny pieces left over sewing thread tied end to end. I sat on the ground next to Papa while he read the letter. He told me it was from Aunt Waka, Mama's sister, who lives in Tokyo. He went through the first few pages fast because Aunt Waka always wrote about the weather and how everyone was and told us about Grandma and Grandpa before she got down to writing about herself. Finally, when Papa got to the first page, he said, Oh, what do you know, Rachel? Aunt Waka's coming to visit us this time. In fact, she'll be here by the 15th of June. I was really surprised when I heard that, because I never in the world thought I would ever see Aunt Walker here in America. I always thought of her as Mama's tragic younger sister because of all the misfortunes in her life. First, her little boy died in dysentery when, she, when he was two. Then, her husband died of tuberculosis the year after. So, she was living with Grandpa and Grandma, doing some sewing to her money, and helping Grandma at his pharmacy. I never thought she'd be able to save up enough money to sell across the city to the You know, she came for a class and on a Japanese ship, but I guess Mama had sent her a little money to help out. To tell the truth, I wasn't all thrilled at the thought of Aunt Walker staying for the whole summer. I mean, I'd probably have to give her my room and move in with Josie. I'd have cows by the since she was going to stop us for the summer to pay quit and earn tuition money for a small semester. It, it would be bad enough with cows gone all summer, I thought. But suppose Aunt Walker turned out to be a melancholy figure and do a lot of weeping and gashing of teeth. When I looked Papa, when I looked at Papa, I thought he wasn't exactly dumb for joy either. He just gave Aunt Walker's letter back to me and put it on the car again without saying anything more. I thought Papa, Papa was probably thinking about the same thing I was about my tragic Aunt Walker, but I was wrong.
I didn't know then. I didn't know it then, but Pablo had a problem that was a lot bigger than having an amato come. And it wasn't until after supper that I found out what it was. And that's chapter one of the dark dreams. Thanks for joining. Have a good day.